Thank you all very much. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, and uh, as you know, our focus uh, this afternoon is on COP29, um, taking place in Baku, um, due to finish today. Um, I think from what I'm reading and hearing, unlikely to finish today. I'm not sure if any of them has ever finished on the day that they were supposed to finish on. But um, the important point is to get agreement, of course, and that tends to run into the weekend at the end of these uh, fortnight, um, fortnight long uh, meetings. So um, it, it, we'll, see, we'll see how it works out over the weekend. Um, obviously, among the, the key priorities of COP29 um, is securing a new goal on um, climate finance and ensuring that um, every country has the means to take the sort of, you know, stronger and robust climate action that's required, slashing greenhouse gas emissions and building uh, resilient uh, communities. Also in focus is the next round of national climate plans or NDCs currently being developed by countries ahead of next year's deadline. And I think the, I mean, all COPs are important, but there's a sort of a consensus there that the next COP COP30 in um, Brazil is going to be a critically important one. But each one is important in its own way. Um, as somebody was just saying earlier, sometimes there's high expectations that are not necessarily met, but very good work can be done. Really good groundwork can be laid at a particular COP that's not, that doesn't look um, at a distance to be great, but amazing amount of work. A bit like work in government, things can happen slowly over years and not necessarily be recognised when it's happening, but then can come to fruition um, later on. So we have an excellent uh, panel uh, this afternoon. And we're going to talk about this COP and what's being achieved and what might be achieved there, what's happening today. And in addition, I think we'll take some time to reflect on um, you know, the whole kind of usefulness and sustainability, perhaps, of the COP process itself. And we've had some discussion on this in the Institute here over the last year or so, um, uh, you know, whether these annual meetings are the best way to proceed and whether there might be other ways. Some of our guest speakers have spoken about regional, you know, regional conferences and regional initiatives perhaps being um, something that should be looked at. But in any event, this is a system we have, and I think probably the, the international community and the UN would be slow to abandon it unless there's clarity about what it would be replaced by. So it's all very well to say that it has drawbacks, but what are you going to do that is going to bring the same kind of attention at such a high level every year in November, December, every year, right across the whole world. And that's um, a, a critical achievement of the COP process, it seems to me, even if some of the meetings uh, are less than successful than others. So we have, as I said, a, as we always say, a stellar lineup, a terrific panel um, with us this afternoon. I want to thank, um, first of all, SSE um, for their kind support and cooperation and collaboration on this event. Very much welcomed. Um, and Sam Peacock is the Managing Director of Corporate Services, Regulatory and Strategy at SSE. And Sam is joining us here on the panel. He's been a member of the uh, SSE Group Executive Committee since 2020 and leads the company's teams overseeing corporate strategy, uh, government and regulatory affairs, communications, brand and local project communications. Before joining SSE, he directed government affairs at the UK regulator Ofgem and worked at leading communications agency Edelman, as well as in the UK Parliament and in the UK government. I'm going to introduce each of the panellists together now at the start, rather than actually giving their bios again when I come to invite them to speak, if that's okay. Aaron Marr is lead sustainability strategist and advisor at ENSO. ENSO, E-N-S-O, is a certified B corporation that helps SMEs with ESG strategy and regulatory preparedness. She holds a BSE from University of Michigan in climate science and impacts engineering with a focus on climate adaptation and an MSc in development practice from Trinity College Dublin. Jerry McEvely, um, right here beside me, is head of policy and Friends of the Earth, where he manages research, advocacy and stakeholder engagement uh, uh, in support of campaigns on fossil fuel phase out and climate action. Jerry has over 15 years experience in developing, researching and influencing policy in both the government and not for profit sectors. Previously, he had policy positions in the Oireachtas, the Department of Foreign Affairs, CRU, as well as a number of NGOs. He's a member of the NESC, uh, the EPA Advisory Committee, and Airgrid's National Advisory Committee. So you can see, super panel. But not, um, last but absolutely not least, 
is um, our speaker joining us um, from uh, Baku. I'm not sure if Sinead is, is standing by as yet. I think she is. Um, Sinead Walsh is a critically important figure in what Ireland is doing and indeed what uh, through Ireland and through the work that Eamon Ryan is doing, um, is achieving um, uh, in Baku. Uh, did uh, also I um, met her in Dubai last year, and she's a probably. We don't like to particularly embrace the term veteran sometimes when it's said about us. It makes us sound a bit old, but I think I'm going to say that Sinead is a veteran in a really good way of this process. Um, is such an important figure. Um, she's climate director in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, uh, she, prior to that, she served as EU ambassador to South Sudan. Um, Dr. Sinead Walsh has worked for Ireland's DFA, or Department of Foreign Affairs, since 2009. She was previously ambassador uh, to Sierra Leone and Liberia and was the head of Irish aid in those uh, two countries. Before joining DFA, Sinead spent 10 years working in the NGO sector and is the co-author of Getting to Zero, a doctor and a diplomat on the Ebola frontline. So Sinead, you are, everybody's welcome, but you are particularly welcome because I can only imagine the pressures um, there and the toing and froing and um, effort to achieve agreement, drafting, words, new words, old words being thrown out, everything that needs to be done. How's it going there, Sinead? And over to you, delighted to have you. Um, yep. Hi folks. And, and thanks, Alex, and, uh, and hi to everybody there. I'd love to be there in person because that would mean that I was no longer here, but I'm still here. I don't expect to be leaving all that soon. Um, uh, I think, look, we really have never any idea when a COP is going to end, but, um, but let's just say I wouldn't be confident that it will end uh, today. Um, I think it will definitely end by tomorrow at midnight, just because the same thing ends up happening at every negotiation where you find out that a whole pile of people have flights at a certain time and you just know that that you'll lose a quorum. So I think uh, my, my calculation, that's midnight tomorrow when we would start losing uh, a quorum uh, with people going to the airport for very long uh, flights with loads of connections. So that would be my, my best guess at the moment uh, if I had, had to put money on it. Um, but I think things are um, definitely progressing and they are getting better. So the status is that we got the second uh, draft of the texts about an hour and a half ago, maybe. Um, so we're still uh, analyzing them. So actually we are, Minister Ryan is in uh, the EU coordination with the other EU ministers at the moment. And I just jumped out to talk to you guys um, and we'll jump back in again. Um, but uh, essentially the second draft of texts, I think uh, is, is definitely uh, better. Um, and so I think we're getting we're getting closer to where we need to be. But I I think our expectation is what the president ha presidency has said is that there will be a further a further draft. Um, so the process now will be, you know, the groups will be giving feedback uh, to the presidency on the current draft. Uh, but I, I think we're 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 seeing uh, we're seeing progress. Um, the big issue for this COP, as I think everybody knows, is, is to agree a new climate finance uh, goal. It has a very unfortunate acronym of the NCQG. Um, and so that I think is where all uh, or, or most eyes are focused on this COP. There's a couple of other uh, really important issues that, which, which, which I'll mention in, in a minute as well. But I think this is definitely the headline. Um, this draft for the first time, because yesterday's draft didn't have it, it has a number. Uh, for the public core, uh, you know, for the finance that should be provided by, um, uh, you know, by, you know, by developed countries to developing countries. So essentially, there is a kind of a, a bigger number, uh, which is kind of what all sources of finance should add up to. And that's 1.3 trillion. And we had that in the draft uh, from yesterday. But today's uh, draft for the first time has a public core, and that's 250 billion. And, and some of you may be following this, certainly people like Jerry would be following this very closely over the years. This climate finance goal is the follow-up to the previous one, and the previous one was 100 billion a year uh, from, you know, essentially developed countries to developing countries for climate finance. So we're talking from 100 to 250, but as you will probably be seeing from the media, um, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, on the developing country side who, who are already saying um, this is not enough and 
you know, who are calling for, for higher uh, numbers. So um, it's going to be a long night uh, and it's going to be a long day. It'll probably just be like one big long day uh, today, which will last through tomorrow, as is often the case at, at, at the end of COP. But we are currently in the EU um, kind of looking at obviously not just that number, but all the other aspects of, of what's in the finance uh, text. Um, and also uh, looking at the other texts. The only text that we haven't seen is Article 6, and, and that is a really important issue for this COP, so I'll, I'll just briefly mention that as well. That's basically the rules around governing carbon markets. So the concept would be, you know, you're the government of the Republic of Congo, you have forests, you, you need help to protect, you need sort of finance to help to protect them and maintain them, and you may you may want to do a deal with either with a country or with a company to buy, you know, kind of carbon credits that you can use and you sort of guarantee to protect the forest. And then you get some finance that might help you to do that. So that's the kind of basic concept. It still it sort of happens already, but it's not very regulated at the moment. So Article six is this kind of long standing negotiation to try to regulate that. And the EU is kind of very strong in that negotiation, trying to make sure that we have good rules, good integrity, uh, good governance around those rules. That's the only text that hasn't come out yet so we're kind of expecting that any minute and that will kind of complete our overall text and um, there are definitely some things that we are um that we're worried about i mean there's always things that we're not going to be happy about and every group is the same so so that's kind of fair enough um but um you know mitigation has definitely strengthened from yesterday to to today but there's still some things that we'd prefer uh if it was in there we're, we're quite worried i think about gender and uh human rights i think overall that has um gotten worse actually um, and and many of you will probably know that gender and human rights has been undergoing uh you know a kind of a pushback in a lot of multilateral fora. Um, so I think that's that's really important as well. So this, you know, as, as many of you will, will know, Alex, you'll certainly know very well, you know, in some ways the, the COP is its own thing, but it's also very much interconnected with, you know, the UN General Assembly or the Commission of the Status of the Women, you know, in New York and all sorts of fora. Um, so, so conceding something here on something like gender and human rights could actually have a wider implication, I suppose, in the global system is is, is the point. And um, but generally, I think we are we are making progress. Um, we are talking to each other. You know, some countries like you know China, for example, have been really quite constructive in this COP. Um, some other parties, who I won't name, but you know who they are, have been very unconstructive. But they're always unconstructive. Um, uh, but I do think we're getting there, and the text um, the texts you know on the whole. Uh, are better than they were yesterday, but I would imagine there'll be one more uh, draft. Maybe just one one last word around kind of Ireland's kind of top priority at this uh, COP, which is which is on adaptation. So Minister Ryan has been the ministerial pair, so presidencies of the COP. So in this case, obviously Azerbaijan, they nominate ministerial pairs to kind of help them you know, get texts over the line. And um, so there's there's one minister from a developed and one minister from a developing country. So that's been Ireland and Costa Rica on adaptation. Um, and that's been quite a, a, a good process, really quite a constructive process. It's not it's not one of the sort of hot button issues of the COP. There are some controversies within there that we've been trying to manage, um, but it's not as difficult as the uh, as the NCQG, the finance goal. Um, and we've really been quite uh, we, we've, we've had a great uh, partnership with Costa Rica, but also we found really kind of constructive parties in the room that want to move forward on on adaptation. Uh, but also we've been pushing very hard. Um, because as, as, as people may know, Ireland, you know, we, we spend 80% of our, our climate finance and adaptation. It's, it's, it's one of our top priorities for diplomacy as well. So we've also been pushing very hard to try and get adaptation finance a proper concrete um, reference within the finance text, uh, not just in the adaptation text, but actually in the finance text to look at sort of concrete measures on how we increase adaptation finance. So I would say those are a couple of the, the big issues uh, for us. Um, and um, Alex, as I think you know, I don't have long, so I don't know if, if it suits. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, but that's I, what we we're going to do in yeah. ease of you and yeah. uh, being aware that you're 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 in the centre of things there. Maybe call away at any minute, and you're so good to give us a, to give us some time. We absolutely, what we'll do is before we go to the other speakers, and they don't mind either. Are there any questions um, that anybody has, including perhaps the other speakers? But anybody here? Also, there are people online, of course, watching. I didn't do the housekeeping at the start. If you're online, you can put a question in. I don't see any at the moment, so I'll concentrate on the people in the room here. Some questions. 
um, if there are any for Sinead before she has to go back to the really important work that she's doing. We won't delay you too long, Sinead, I promise. So, anybody like to um, pose any question? Yeah, Barry. Thanks very much, Sinead. It's Barry Colfer here from the IIA. Thanks so much for being available. Can you just say anything, generally speaking, about the mood there compared to previous COPs? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say, look, I'd say it's a bit mixed. I mean, obviously, the, the election of... Um, Donald Trump, given given that the last time he was elected, he he pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement, um, wasn't a great kind of a baseline, maybe to, you know something that happened literally earlier this uh, this month, but at the same time, we're kind of seeing a bit what we saw the last time he was um, elected in in, in twenty sixteen, which is that there's a kind of a rallying um, of other people, and I wonder whether the kind of constructive positive engagement that we've seen from China might also relate to to that. I, clearly, I have no idea. <laughs> but, you know, I do think that that has been a noteworthy. Um, and also you've got, you know, great solidarity within the EU room and, and you know, really push people pushing, uh, you know, mitigation also that we have to, you know, build on what we got in Dubai last year and mitigation. We, you know, we, we can't Kind of forget about that, and, and Alex mentioned the 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 the, the nationally uh, the national mitigation plans that are due in Brazil, and how this COP is supposed to give signals for that. So so there's a really strong push for everybody that we kind of have to that we kind of have to double down. So so the mood is kind of mixed in a way. I mean, the the, the finance goal was always going to be incredibly uh, difficult. Um, and it is incredibly difficult. And as I said, <laughs> we're not finished. Um, but I think the mood today is better than yesterday because I think on the whole, the texts have have improved. Like I say, some of them have disapproved like gender and, and, and human rights references. Um, but I would say on the whole, they've improved. Uh, so, you know, I think the mood is kind of is getting better. Um, but, it, but it's such a critical point that we, and I think Ireland, we have a real ability to do this and we're trying to do this. You know, we need to be showing solidarity and empathy with the developing countries, particularly the least developed countries and the small island states that Ireland focuses on a lot, um, you know, who are suffering horrendous impacts and who mitigate almost nothing, um, you know, and who are understandably very angry. And then, you know, when you talk about finance, it's obviously extremely tense and and, and all of that. And, and many of us, uh, not Ireland, uh, but, you know, there's other European countries that are in very difficult fiscal situations at the moment. So um, so it's a tricky time. And so, yeah, like I say, the mood is is kind of mixed. Um, and I suppose we're trying to play our, our little role in terms of, you know, helping to show that that solidarity and that empathy with developing countries while also trying to you know sort of say look we'll do what we can but you know we we're not going to be able to sort of come up with astronomical numbers because it's simply not realistic uh in in, in, in given the fiscal situations of a lot of the big countries so yeah so it's it's tricky but i think um i think it's better than it was yesterday i think yesterday was quite a difficult quite a difficult day because there was a lot of unhappiness with the first draft and today it's 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 a bit better and hopefully uh yeah hopefully we can come up with something look it's one of those things you know if everybody's unhappy then it's been a successful negotiation so that's what we're aiming for we're trying to make everybody equally unhappy but nobody way more unhappy uh, than everybody else Okay, Sam, did you did you indicate to me like? And I, I'm not going to hold you, Sinead. I will let you go after your next response. I promise. Or other, unless you have to go right now, in which case we won't be in the least bit. No, no, I can take one more. No problem. No problem. Three minutes. Yeah. So, so Sam, um, and I'm just wondering whether Aaron or or Jerry, at, you know, at the same time, have 30 seconds of something that they were going to say that maybe Sinead might respond to. But if you don't, that's okay. 30 seconds. That was really what we're talking about. Or a minute. Thanks very much, Sam. SSC, Sam from SSE. Hi, oh, yeah. you can hear me reasonably clearly, Sinead. Um, I was just, you're obviously right in the middle of it at the moment. So mine was more a question because people were certainly externally talking about the next COP in Brazil as being a kind of bigger one with the NPCs coming. And it was all about getting that enabling finance to help the developing com countries kind of go into that. If you're looking at the deal that's in front of you today, do you think that gives you enough? Gives us enough energy to get a good cop next year. Does it? Does it set us back? Does it keep 
does it mm. kind of set that up well? Just interested in your perspective. I appreciate asking you to project yourself forward when you're probably right in the middle of it. But I was just interested good. in your perspective. Yeah. 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 Good good context. Yeah, absolutely. It's it is a really good question and and I think it just entirely depends on who you ask. Um it's also like it's far too early for us to know because we're we're still negotiating, right? So we don't expect anybody to say that they're happy, right? At this point, everybody's going to say they're outraged and all that kind of thing. And you don't necessarily know <laughs> how people really feel until it's all kind of done and dusted. Some people genuinely will be outraged and some people will be saying they're outraged because they're trying to get a better deal. Um, but I think it all I think another another kind of point of it is it depends very much what kind of a country you are. One of the things that we're saying, I mean, that I mean, we say as Ireland, <laughs> like, you know, 84 percent of Ireland's climate finance goes to the least developed countries and small island states. Right. So we're a particular example of we really prioritize the most vulnerable countries. But that's not necessarily the case for a lot of the climate finance. And so I think if you're if you're an LDC or a SID, you you really need us to come up with a, a, a good public finance number. If you're a middle income country, um, you know, you you might be more interested in the outer layer. So you might be more interested in the investments, you know, with with the language that's in what, what we call the more qualitative language in the finance text, which is more about levels of concessionality, you know, kind of what can we do around around debt issues, around de-risking. So like I remember Minister Ryan and I and, and others were in the um, Africa Climate Summit last year, which was hosted by Kenya in Nairobi, and they very much were saying, like, we're not looking for your grants, we're looking for your investment. They, they used this specific, uh, you know, term, they said, we're looking for fairness, we're look not looking for freebie. So they were very much saying, we see we see climate action. Now, Kenya is in a particularly good situation with hydro power and so on. But they were saying, you know, we see climate action very much as, you know, you know th that we can get lots of engagement of the private sector and so on. So we need, you know, we need the sort of debt situation, the interest rates and so on and so forth to be fair, but we don't need grants. Whereas if you're from, you know, kind of uh, Malawi or Sierra Leone and so on, so, so you, you're more interested in that inner public core and you need that to be high enough. And if you're other countries, you might be like, no, look, if we get if we get better terms of trade, then we can manage. So I think it's I think we'll have to wait and see how the dust settles, both on that public core and then on those more sort of qualitative elements, which we hope are going to give signals to also other processes like, you know, World Trade Organization and so on, because uh, this is often how things happen in, in, in our system, that the cop will call for something and then the same countries in an ideal world, we'll try and make some of that stuff more operational in the multilateral development banks with the WTO or so on. So I think um, I think we'll have to see how the dust settles. I think if you if you ask people today, they will say, absolutely not, it's outrageous, but we're still in the middle of a negotiation, so you don't really expect the truth. So maybe ask me in a week and I'll have an answer for that. Well, part of your job is distinguishing between actual outrage and performative outrage. <laughs> As I, I gather from what you're saying. Thank you so much, Sinead. I'm going to let you go. It's coming up on the half hour. Um, I'm sure the pressure is on there. And just thank you so much for your time uh, that you've given us this afternoon. It's really valuable. And for what you've said, but also for the opportunity to kick off some more discussion here after you've gone. So best of luck with everything. No no worries, Alex. It's a pleasure. And uh, I'm, I, as I've been told that it's being recorded, so I'll watch the rest of you later on. And, and sorry to have to dash. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks again. Thanks again. Um, Jerry, um, I think I'll go to you first. And um, uh, what we did was we thought we'd invite each of our panelists maybe to give us four or five minutes just on your sense, both from what you've heard from Sinead, but also generally on your sense um, and, um, you know, what Friends of the Earth, how you've been viewing this COP, uh, the context of it, where it might lead us. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jerry McKevley. I'm head of policy in Friends of the Earth Ireland, and we are an NGO which primarily campaigns and does research and advocacy and education on climate justice issues, particularly on areas related to climate action, fossil fuel phase out and energy efficiency. And I should start by saying, um, even trying to focus on any one work stream or action area COP29, it is such a giant behemoth. I really appreciate uh, Sinead coming out to uh, give her views 
um, and there's just such a risk of oversimplification. And I should say this situation is actually quite representative of being at COP, where a text has just come out and you're very confident that everything you're about to say or that everything that you have said is now out of date. So if, if Friends of the Earth ends up being significantly more critical tomorrow, you'll understand, you'll understand why. Um, but I want to address um, three areas and they touch upon some of the points that Sinead made around the levels of climate finance and the references to fossil fuels in the text, which broadly speaking, NGOs are not happy with in terms of what's just been released. Um, in terms of climate finance, so the negotiations in this area have a, an extremely long and complicated history. I'm only going to scratch the surface. I'm also relying heavily on updates from my colleagues at COP. That's why I was looking at my, my phone, particularly from uh, my colleague, Sean, who's there, Sean McLaughlin. But um, so the new collective quantified goal is the framework under which the negotiation to, this, to establish scale of climate finance post-2025 um, uh, replacing the existing uh, existing annual 100 billion goal. That's what's being discussed. We're in a situation where, as you've heard, trillions, not billions are needed, particularly through grants. This is very easy for an NGO to throw out, but this is the reality of what um, climate vulnerable countries are really facing. And there's a situation where not only have inadequate sums been committed to, but it's also often in the forms of loans or not clearly focused on achieving Paris commitments. Um, we also have a situation where pledges for funding irreparable climate impacts, which is called loss and damage, are nowhere near they need to be. And um, several states and NGOs are calling for a particular sub-goal in that area. And at the same time, there's also an increasing focus on raising levels of public finances through other sources. And this is also where you may have heard, you know, that there's a real focus on sources of finance through the likes of... Um, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and making the polluters pay through uh, levies on fossil fuels, for example, in the area of shipping and aviation. On the negative side, the text that is there at the moment, there is nowhere near the specificity that is needed. And there's a real fear of loopholes that where, for example, phrases are present which simply refer to other sources of finance or including innovative sources of finance that st uh, states do not there's gaps and of course states need up to this is a key point actually states need to live up to their um, existing public finance commitments that have been made but in terms of this language on innovative sources um, there's a particular concern for example that carbon markets or carbon credits could be labeled as um as climate finance um so um while we can't you know at all dismiss the need for states to deliver on their own public uh, climate finance commitments i would personally regard it as a positive that the spotlight is actually on the fossil fuel industry and levies because that's something that has been too contentious at previous cops um, in terms of I want to turn briefly to the area of mitigation and fossil fuel phase out. And this is very much linked to the negotiations on both agendas. So it's states and the negotiating blocks when they're there, they're, you know, nothing's agreed until everything's agreed, that they expect progress on both, on both work streams. And progress in this area is also far from guaranteed. And some of this refers back to the commitments that were made at the last COP, you know, you would have heard of um, commitments around um, uh, the global stock take and, uh, yeah, tri you know, um, significant increases in renewables and energy efficiency, which is broadly called the UAE consensus, to use the terminology. But the point is that in terms of the text that's there, even getting a repetition of the commitment from um, COP28 at Baku, the repetition of that language is far from guaranteed, which is really problematic. It was actually taken out of one negotiating work stream last week, which you may have, some of you may have seen reports of. And there's a real um, demand for uh, 
what, what many of you would know as climate pledges or a nationally determined contributions or NDCs that these new climate pledges have to be brought out next year or enhanced ones, I should say, and that these need to integrate, and this may sound blindingly obvious to some of you, but that these actually need to integrate those commitments around fossil fuel phase out. So when countries come forward with their new plans or pledges, that it integrates language on fossil fuel phase out in terms of production and consumption. Um, and long story short, that is far from guaranteed. Just want to make a few final points on the usefulness of COP or reflecting on COP, if that's okay. Would or will I come back to that? As a kind of a phase in the discussion. That's absolutely and fine. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and, but I will come back to it yeah. and I will come back to you. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. to move it for the initial sense mm -hmm. from the others. Mm -hmm. And then we will come back to that theme as we progress. So, Aaron, I gave your introduction earlier. We, the, the folks know who you are. You're very welcome to them. Um, I know you've been watching this COP closely and indeed other COPs. I think you've been podcasting and, <laughs> and, yeah. and doing commentary. Yeah. So how, how, what do you reckon? How, how do you judge it at the moment? And what's, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here with this amazing panel and having this discussion. Um, as you said so eloquently, it's really, really difficult to follow singular work streams at COP. So how I try to look at it and break it down is through kind of four key points. I tried to make these four A's, but they weren't all A's. So it's the action, accessibility, adaptation, and then kind of who's at the table. That's the one I couldn't get the A for. But so um, attendance, yes, there we go. Awesome. So basically for me, I'm looking at those four things across any work streams that they're doing, whether it's finance, mitigation, um, whether it's discussing carbon markets. And the reason I'm looking at it this way is because a big part of what I do and what a lot of us are working towards now is translating what's going on at COP for yeah. normal people. What does this mean <laughs> for us? What does this mean for the businesses we run? What does this mean for Ireland, for Dublin, for our hometowns, whatever that might be? So first, in terms of Adaptation, this is something that's always been really, really important to me. My background is in climate adaptation. We have locked in effects of climate change, regardless of if we stopped emitting right this second, there would be impacts. We're seeing them already, even with these like this big cold snap, the way that the polar vortexes are changing, we're seeing that right now. So I always am looking at for progress on that global goal for adaptation and the specific guidance and finance for making that happen. And there hasn't been a whole lot, which was a bit of a disappointment for me. Maybe something miraculously will come out in the next 24 hours. We'll see. But that's something that I'm always looking at and have been kind of disappointed on for the past couple of years. But a lot of non-state actors have come out with more interesting and promising ideas around that adaptation, which I can discuss in more detail later on. And um, then we've got that accessibility who can access the climate finance? How do they get it? Is it tied to anything for them getting that aid? Are they gonna be required to buy from a certain um, person or pay that back in a certain way? Or is it a grant? So looking at how is that broken down? Who has access to it and how do they get it? Um, which is something I think is currently missing from the information we have. It's probably in that text that Sinead is looking at as we speak. So seriously in 10 minutes we could know more about it and um, yeah. so that's the next thing I look at then there's that attendance and thank you for that fourth a <laughs> um it's so important who is at the table who is making these decisions is it the most developed countries that are not feeling these huge impacts or are we giving a centering voice to these small island developing states to the least developed nations that really probably have the best handle on how climate change is impacting us and will continue to impact us because they are seeing the brunt of it. So we want them at the table who is um, deciding on this text and who's happy and who's not. Or as Sinead put it really nicely, who's the most unhappy? Um, I liked that a lot. I think that's kind of <laughs> really where we're at with COP. Um, and then, so we've got our attendance, accessibility, um, and then action is the last one that I haven't talked about yet. COP has always felt to me like the, for some reason we're treating it as the pinnacle of the climate year where it should be the beginning of our action year. So I like to see what comes out of COP. What are the tangible goals, which we probably won't know until 
into next week um, when everyone starts to dissect it and decide how we're going to start to mobilize um, as private actors, public, act public actors, uh, governments, whatever that might be. But for me, I want to boil it down into where are we going and then how do we get there? Because that's the best way we found to communicate it from a higher level to why does it matter for us? So those are my yeah four A's right. to look at through COP. Really clear. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, um, SSE. Uh, I know that you 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 certainly because I was there myself last year. Very prominent there. Um, I mean, the people who are I don't know are familiar with COP, but I mean it's just it's just a vast city. You know, it's just there's so much happening. It's an extraordinary phenomenon of a thing just to witness and. Um, companies like SSE will, I think, make big efforts, certainly you did, to insert yourself, not just to be there and be visible, but to insert yourself into the discussion, which I think is admirable and really important, and to lead events and to chair events and to invite. I think last year you hosted the the UK, the then UK climate minister, as far as I recall, was there, the, head, the then head of the climate council in the UK. So you're in, you're in the debate as well as saying, look, we're here, here's SSE, look at us, you're in the debate as well. So has that been the case this year and how do you view this year's COP? Yeah, and, and, and thanks thanks to the, the IIEA for the session. I mean, your, your first point is a really interesting one though, of what you see when you're there. It's quite it's quite overawing and humbling actually because mm. you see people from all around the world. Mm. There's tribes people there, you see there was a kind of yurt in the Mongolian section. Mm. There's all sorts of fascinating, interesting things. It was the fourth one I've been to, I found it very interesting. Just a word on why we go mm. as SSE, then maybe what we saw. Um, COP is a brilliant act of moment to bring a lot of actors involved in the energy transition in the same place. We find that very useful to have kind of conversations around how you unblock delivery barriers, how you can try and make clean investment happen. So a lot of the time we kind of spend our time, yeah, we're, we're investing 40 billion in clean energy over the next decade. So we've in nine countries. So there's a lot of that international debate we find valuable. We spend quite a lot of time, I suppose, sharing knowledge, offering advice and, and trying to show some support for the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to give you one example of some of the strange conversations you get to in, in, in COP, I mean, we were sort of this time talking to the Cape Verde Islands about how they could do hydro. We were talking in the past about to Sri Lanka about how you might be able to do offshore wind because they, they've got fantastic resource there. And you mm -hmm. find that there's a company there, people are interested. I mean, we're, we're putting, if you think about the offshore wind, we're building Dogger Bank, world's largest offshore wind farm, 150 kilometres off the North Sea, and you're basically putting in hundreds of the Eiffel Tower and then hundreds of the London Eye. And, and people are interested in that because mm. other countries want to make that happen. In terms of what we saw there, it was to echo Sinead's point, she's obviously closer to the action than we are, but you definitely felt like an in-between cop with a lot of the focus on that finance kind of gearing up for next year. Um, I suppose there's an overwhelming vibe on the energy transition that it's happening, but it's not happening quite fast enough. You can mm. really feel that everywhere. I felt some of the, the US backdrop, we were talking about this a couple of minutes ago, the US backdrop was tricky. Um, you kind of had the Biden team on one side talking about how they've used the IRA to lower the cost of different energy technologies, but you also had the kind of when will they pull out piece. You, Europe, the European debate was very interesting. A lot mm. about how you decarbonize, but obviously German factories, how do we keep the costs low? There was a lot of that sort of transition discussion in Europe that was interesting. And to Sinead's point, the kind of, glo the sort of global south discussion, we were involved in bits of that. There's much around how you finance it with interest, inflation flying around and, and all that. I thought, just a comment on Ireland, and Rob was raised it when we caught up earlier, as, as well when we were dis discussing with the guys here. I thought Eamon Ryan was very visibly, very leading from the front for, for Ireland. You could see the, the kind of work he's been doing as a lead negotiator was extremely powerful. Felt like Ireland was sort of leading on some of the just transition arguments, which we were very, very supportive of. And the general kind of cooperation theme, whether it's things like carbon trading and make, making sure that that's a kind of, you know, as, as wide and linked schemes as possible and, and other forms of cooperation, I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and then probably just the, the, the last main point I, I, I'd just make is you speak to all these different countries, you speak to all these different people who are trying to do energy transition. And some of the same themes always come back how do you get planning faster how do you make sure the market works mm. how do you make sure the grid's there how do you make sure how do we deal with we talking earlier about how do you deal with the jerry was talking about how do you deal with data center demand mm. and what was really interesting is sometimes we think it's all very very different and special and unique in, in our countries but a lot mm. of those challenges are the same mm. and and when i think about here you sort of 
maybe four years ago at COP, everyone's talking about renewables. Finally, two years ago, people started talking about grid. And mm. now people are beginning to talk about how that clean flexibility evolves. Mm. It's probably a little bit like that in Ireland, some mm. of the debates. Here. Mm. So I'll probably leave it at that because I think we're talking mm. about the process. But jaw-droppingly interesting. Yeah. Um, we find it valuable and we try and contribute something to it. Mm. Mm. Just the overall, I'm constantly Aaron and others touched on it like this, bringing it to the level of, you know, how people feel about what the outcome might be, a sense of optimism or a sense of pessimism, and the mood can kind of rise and fall, including at the actual COP, the mood, you know, Sinead, even in her few minutes saying, it feels pretty good that we might be making tracks, but it could go all terribly wrong very quickly. And there, or there could be a terrible protracted period of a really low mood, and then suddenly something happens, somebody cracks or somebody, you know, somebody changes. So, I mean, it, it, uh, that seems to be that seems to be the vibe there, right? Uh, uh, this afternoon, doesn't it? It's 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 like, what was your thing about like who's the least who's the least unhappy or who's the most happy? You know, it's like it's if 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 somebody's unhappy, well, then maybe the the reality is that it's going well. <laughs> if you look to see who's unhappy, like these, this is the way the human mind works. You know, like if 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 like if country uh, square brackets insert. The name of the if they're unhappy, well then we're probably making progress. Isn't that the way sometimes you have to judge it? Unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually maybe going to challenge that perspective. Okay, well do please bit. do. I mean, oh, no, actually, please do. because given some, maybe the state of some of the debates on yeah. the, the climate finance, it's not purely the the levels of figures. I know yeah. trillions was mentioned yeah. and um, two hundred and fifty billion. Mm. It's the real fine detail mm. I mean, like like mm. legislation or policy mm. around qualitatively how it's provided and in what form and i guess mm. there would be some at the moment who would be stating that perhaps uh, this may change rapidly as you just said alex but that no deal yeah would be better than a bad deal so that is it's worth i mm. guess mm -hmm. considering that that may equally be an outcome yeah mm -hmm. i mean yeah, yeah. Back yeah. Off mm. that, Please, we yeah. were discussing that earlier today the fact that the, when I first heard that no deal is something that could theoretically happen, I was like, why would that ever be a better outcome? But I do think moving forward into COP30 and how important it is with the new NDCs and with it being on at the same time as the G20 um, in the same place, which could be really interesting for moving forward. Yeah, you don't want to move backwards this year. Um, I personally now actually am thankful because Sinead made me feel a little bit better about where it's going um, because she's right there on the ground, but it could change really rapidly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, on balance, you have to think that there's there's higher than a 50 percent chance that there's an agreement that's going to happen, you know, in some shape or form. It may be one that people find hard to sell, but there's going to be something coming out of it, I'd have thought. Um, but that's just from observing previous. Um, anybody like to come in? Anybody like to ask a question or make an observation? Yeah, Francis. Francis Jacobs, where is the leadership coming at the, the COP? Obviously, many of the uh, prime ministers haven't turned up this time. And I'd like to know, what is the role of the European Union? Sometimes in the past, it's been very strong, other times weaker. China, Sinead said, was being constructive. But what about countries like India? And I won't, obviously, the other thing, of course, is the United States in the pre-Trump oh to ERA and uh, to what extent some of the sub-federal actors are playing a role. Can we take a stab at that? I can start. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. No, I, say, yeah. I can start off with um, kind of the pre-Trump era. I came in very prepared for this question because I knew you hear the accent and you're going to want to talk about it. Um, I'm operating on the assumption we will pull out again the United States um, because it's just better to think that way and Maybe we get lucky and he forgets about it with all the rest of the craziness. Uh, but yeah, so I think the kind of regional and state, like state by state actors, even this year are way more important for the United States um, than they have been in the past because they are going to be a little bit more, there's gonna be a little bit less turbulence there because we have some continuity in governance in most of the country. The, the gubernatorial races aren't usually the same year as the presidential race. So it um, gives a little bit of continuity there. However, I think that our strength as a country is lacking because someone like the EU comes in with 
so much knowledge, so many resources, so many people and different countries that have the, this experience and the solutions and the knowledge to share, just like you were talking about. Um, and we lose a lot of that when we don't bring the entire country to the table. And I'm sad about that, but hopeful actors like New England, like the Great Lakes states will really make a difference. And because we get a little more local, we might get the opportunity to engage with people like India, China, and like indigenous communities on a more human level, which I think could be really, really positive. Um, mm. And I think we've seen a little bit more of that in this COP outside of the negotiation room. We've seen a lot of really cool yeah. non-state actors from really diverse areas yeah. come up with great. I great mean, solutions. on that point, and 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 not taking from Francis and um, the tenor of Francis' um, question, isn't it almost as important, if not arguably more important, to have a multiplicity, to have to have all voices there, all countries there, uh, as it is to have. Uh, particular leaders there in the sense I mean or, or somebody taking a leadership position of course you want them there but the, you know then the notion that they would come through because the, the nature of international affairs at the moment and geopolitics is such that you know it's not happening and that we we know there are complex reasons why that's happening I mean there are wars there are there's been an election in the state you know there's a massive there's an awful lot happening even outside this agenda that would seem to mitigate against there being uh, the, the possibility to unite around leaders would you? Yeah, I'd agree with that point. I, I think the leader's point was interesting. Is obviously von der Leyen was doing the hearings, so that kind of pulled her away from it. I think she'd have been there. She'd have been there otherwise. Obviously, what we're seeing in in Germany is slowed and stuff down. You made the US points better than I could. You could certainly see during those Trump years before, and I was there for a few of them. Um, you could you could you could see the states stepping up, um, and it wasn't just California. You could see people from all over all over parts of the US. I think what is interesting. Yeah, there did still feel momentum when I was there. I mean, even if you just take China, which we don't often talk about, and obviously there's still way too much coal there, but you do see them putting on more solar in the last year than pretty much the US has ever. So you're seeing they're going hell for leather for it. And, and you did see as you walked around, you saw the different nationalities. While those, the big fish might not have been there, a lot of the people are actually doing some of the work were, mm -hmm. and you've got a real sense that people were still working hard. And if maybe that's mm. not going as well in Sinead's room, mm. there were other people sharing how you get the grid moving quicker. Mm. There were other people talking mm. about how you get permitting faster. Mm. So some of those perhaps lower down mm. conversations. Yeah. And regional as well, Correct. of course. Isn't that a factor as well? Jerry, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, a couple of different points. So mm. I think, first of all, um, I think certain groups and countries have been critical of the EU, going back to the original question around mm. um, the lack of either ambition or specificity on some of the climate finance targets, and particularly around this whole area of loss and damage. Mm. That could all change very rapidly as we reach final agreement, and ultimately we're not in the negotiating rooms. Mm -hmm. But I, I also wanted to touch upon one sure. point around Minister Ryan's work just before we finish up. And like, needless to say, Friends of the Earth does an awful lot of work and communication and advocacy to parties. Not all of us, I would freely admit, supportive, but are uh, positive, I should say. But I am struck by the level of time and commitment that Minister Ryan mm. has given to the UNFCCC, to the COPs, and by extension, officials like Sinead. And I don't, to use an Irish expression, I'm not simply trying to claw moss here. Yeah, the point is actually, yeah, as we look towards mm. the general election, it's far from guaranteed that a future minister would necessarily either be able or be willing um, to dedicate that level of time to the international agenda. And that's something that we really want to see continued, including through the likes of um, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, this diplomatic initiative that has real mm. potential to deliver positive change. Um, and I also wanted to, moving um, backwards almost, I wanted to touch upon um, attendance at COPs and, and the role of the COPs. Mm. Yeah, um, and you, you can slide into that discussion now, if you like, yeah, uh, where I, I stopped you earlier. Okay, yeah. yeah I mean, like, uh, I from having been there, it's, um, it's obviously absolutely central, and no one is suggesting, I think particularly from an Irish perspective, that this key multilateral process should be simply be removed. Mm. But it is very much a intergovernmental process uh, negotiation mixed with one part networking and two part two parts corporate trade 
event mm. and it's that has positives and um, i would say it is a little bit like um a festival with predominantly men in suits mm. the irony irony is not lost that i am here a man in a suit <laughs> but um there are to, to actually the more the more important point is a couple of important points number one where we are at climate at the moment there are the huge risks and we're, we're seeing it play out you know particularly we've seen in the likes of valencia we are not mm. going in in the right direction mm. and on the back of that and this is where it links into into attendance the huge degree of disillusionment there is when um whether it's individuals or ngos or other organizations attend cop that there often isn't that level of urgency reflected and even more importantly, and I think, you know, you touched upon this, it is not a simple process attending COP. Mm. Men are overrepresented, represented, mm. lack of representation by women and real difficulties for developing states and um, climate vulnerable states attending the COPs as well. Mm. Having said all, all of that, it is the moment of the year that all states and the media are focused on COP. So we can't mm. get away from it. And um, Mary Robinson and others, I know, wrote um, an open letter recently, other leaders on reforms to the COP, mm. um, including in uh, trying to limit uh, the influence of perhaps states which are not supportive of this agenda. And also, and I'll, I'll finish on this, trying to, and this is not easy, but restrict the influence and attendance of fossil fuel lobbyists. Mm. And I guess there, there is a challenge that I don't, I don't think NGOs would want the COP necessarily to become a very limited technical exercise and opportunity for stakeholder engagement. But um, the level of um, representation by fossil fuel lobbyists is significant. There's analysis been done that I think there's about 700, 1,700 fossil fuel lobbyists in attendance now including several from as part of the EU's delegation. And I mean, it, it's also, it, this is not an easy thing to, uh, mm. to address. I mean, it's hardly mm. like fossil fuel lobbyists are walking around in GAA jerseys. They, they are, they're part of country delegations. We have issues that grid, you know, uh, excuse me, you know, state gas companies are equally there. So this is not, it's not an easy process, mm. but I think, the recommendations by Mary Robinson and others offer a useful place to yeah. start. I mean, just on that, Aaron, I mean, it's all often occurred to me that, I mean, as you say, it's a tricky issue, as Jerry says, but, you know, because, of course, the other, the other side of the argument is what's the famous thing that, you know, Fergus Finley or somebody said about the negotiations here, you know, if, if Sinn Féin weren't in the room, like, you know, not worth a penny candle or something, so what would be the point in having a discussion that key players weren't there? And, of course, these big companies are players and the the challenge may be i just put this as a sort of devil's advocate i mean the challenge is not so much to find a way of excluding them much as maybe many of us would like but to ensure sufficiently robust states and state organizations and the un in particular ultimately where agreements are made that they they give the proper weight to th that kind of influence which ought not to be a dominant one yeah this is actually a great great question and a great topic um the reality is these companies, these actors have influence and they're going to be a key part of the way society operates. Mm. So they're going to be part of these conversations on global crises and mm. global action. However, right now, and this is a fault of a lot of developed countries and developed economies, countries are treated almost like people or people with interests and people mm. with power because they have so much money and they hold so many jobs and things like that. I think there has to be a shift from this almost fear of upsetting them and their profits to prioritizing that stakeholder engagement, prioritizing people mm -hmm. and prioritizing sustainable jobs and sustainable engagements with companies because the private sector has an incredible opportunity to make a huge difference if they're coming at it from the right perspective. And in my day-to-day -day work, I work specifically with SMEs and I see that will with so many of them and SMEs make up a huge, 
huge contingent of our economy here in Ireland, in the United States, the UK, and globally, but they are not getting the same representation as the big conglomerate giants of the world. Um, and I really think that they could come in with some cool solutions if we could figure out how to shift that power balance. Um, I am not the expert in diplomacy to know exactly how to do that, um, but that would be a dream. And it's part of the reason why a lot of my hope with COP lies in the networking and lies in the knowledge sharing and the side events that are not necessarily in the room. I would love to get an amazing agreement that like we all feel really excited about and feel energized to act on, but it's a huge diplomatic event. I don't see that happening. Sure. Like it's just impossible. It's hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you see partnerships between organizations like SSE and other countries or other actors, and then they do something really cool and innovative, like that's where my hope and excitement comes mm -hmm. from. And if we could shift the power from the big companies to these really cool, innovative mm -hmm. um, partnerships, I think we'd really be moving in the right direction on um, taking the power out of the corporation's hands. Sounds like a nice cue for us to finish with Sam, which I will. But um, I, I took my eye off the audience. Was there any other final, not necessarily a question, because we won't have time really for too many answers, but we can certainly have an observation. Yeah, that man over there. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm curious where methane has gone in the conversation. There was a very hard fought global methane pledge a few years ago. I mean, it's kind of commonly accepted now, finally, that it's responsible for around 30%, a third of um, global warming. It's 80 times more global warming potential over a 20 year time horizon. Feels like it could be a cornerstone to decarbonize, especially for developed economies like Ireland in a in a way that's um, in compliance sure. with our nationally determined contributions. So how could we maybe keep that a bit more central? Sure, I'll take that as a as a sort of as a statement or as as a as a creed occur as you know that we should be doing it. And in fact, we're doing some work, a lot of work in the institute now. We have a project going on agriculture on the impact of climate on agriculture and agriculture trade in particular in Ireland. So very conscious of that. And thank you for the point. Is there anybody else would just like to um, say something briefly before I go to Sam? For a final word and i don't think that there is and thank you again sam for the ssc for your support for this event and thanks for your, um your participation but i'll thank all the panelists at the end would you like to have a last word yeah it's just just last word on that cop process because i thought yeah. the letter the mary robinson letter was very very interesting because mm. you can what it i think it said was you've delivered a lot through cops i know 29 i don't forget to cop 60 we're in, we're in problems mm. but from cop 29 mm. If you look back, you've created these carbon budgets that countries have put forward. You had moments like the deforestation commitment in, mm. in the Glasgow. These are these are valuable things, such as, as, as the funding one we've got now. And my one worry is, while I want to get the, the process more focused on delivery, because I think the age of targets is over and it's now about delivery and measurement, and really enforcing that through and having a robust process around that. I, I don't I don't want it to end up in so much in a navel gazing process where we talk about the process and don't actual prioritize action because there's a period really pace over perfection. So I sort of hope that that debate resolves itself quite quickly mm. in a way that drives more action and pace and that we don't mm. just go on some governance roadshow for a long time. Mm. Very good. Well, you've left it on a positive note, reasonably, uh, relatively speaking. So thank you um, very much, um, Sam Peacock, SSE, Aaron Marr um, of ENSO, Jerry McEvely of Friends of the Earth, earlier Sinead Walsh, Dr. Sinead Walsh, Climate Director in the Department of Foreign Affairs. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. We haven't been pouring over the um, outcome of, of COP29 because we don't know it yet, but we're all left in, I think, re with a reasonable level of uh, optimism, I think, um, that the weekend will, will, come, will come to some form of agreement and lay the groundwork, as Sam and others have been saying, for Brazil next year. Thanks, everybody, for your attendance. As always, great to have you here. Thank you for attending online if you did. We'll see you all soon.